Hey, sweet squirrels. I hope I can read today and stay awake. <laughs> I feel like I got some good sleep last night. My eyes look a little more open, don't they? <laughs> Y'all, <laughs> me reading this Wuthering Heights. <sighs> I'm not educated enough, I don't think. <laughs> These words and the dialects. Oh, my gosh. But we'll, <laughs> we'll take another stab at it. Oh, mercy me. Okay, I'll go back to the last little bit I read. Thou art the man, cried Jabez after a solemn pause, leaning over his cushion. Seventy times seven times didst thou gapingly contort thy visage. Seventy times seven did I take counsel with my soul. Lo, this is, a, this is human weakness. This also may, may be absolved. The first of the seventy-first is to come. Brethren, execute upon him the judgment written. Such honor have all his saints. With that concluding word, the whole assembly, exalting their pilgrim staves, rushed round me in a body, and I, having no weapon to raise in self-defense, commenced grappling with Joseph, my nearest and most ferocious assailant, for his... In the confluence of the multitude, several clubs crossed, blows aimed at me, fell on other sconces. Presently, the whole chapel resounded with rappings and counter-rappings. Every man's hand was against his neighbor. And Bronderham, unwilling to remain idle, poured forth his zeal in a shower of loud taps on the boards of the pulpit, which resounded so smartly that at last, to my unspeakable relief, they woke me. I was going to say, I hope this is a dream. <laughs> and what was it that had suggested the tremendous tumult? What had played Jabez's part in the row? Merely the branch of a fir tree that touched my lattice, lattice as the blast wheeled by, and rattled its dry cones against the panes. I listened undoubtedly an instant, detected the disturber, then turned and dozed, and dreamt again, if possible, still more disagreeably than before. I don't think I could have gone back to sleep. So I think he's saying that those sounds came into his dream. As, has that ever happened to you? It has to me. Like, I'll be dreaming... Like maybe an alarm goes off, and that's somehow in my dream as something else. This time I remembered I was lying in an oak closet and heard distinct, distinctly the gusty wind and the drivings of the snow. I heard also the fir bough repeat its teasing sound and ascribed it to the right cause, but it annoyed me so much that I resolved to silence it if possible. And I thought, I rose and endeavored to unhasp the casement. The hook was soldered into the staple, a circumstance observed by me when awake, but forgotten. I must stop it nevertheless, I muttered, knocking my knuckles through the glass and stretching an arm out to seize the import importunate branch instead of which my fingers closed on the fingers of a little ice-cold hand. The intense horror of nightmare came over me. I tried to draw back my arm, but the hand clung to it, and a most melancholy voice sobbed, Let me in. Let me in. Who are you? I asked, struggling, meanwhile, to disengage myself. Catherine Linton, it replied shiveringly. Why did I think of Linton? I had read Earnshaw twenty times for Linton. I'm come home. i am lost my way on the moor. As it spoke, I discerned obscurely a child's face looking through the window. Terror made me cruel, and finding it useless to attempt shaking the creature off, I pulled its wrist onto the broken pane and rubbed it to and fro till the blood ran down and soaked the bedclothes. Still it wailed. Let me in, and maintained its tenuous grip, gripe, not grip, almost maddening me with fear. How can I, I said at length, let me go, if you want me to let you in. 
The fingers relaxed. I snatched mine through the hole, hurriedly piled the books up in a pyramid against it, and stopped my ears to exclude the lamentable prayer. I seemed to keep them closed above a quarter of an hour, yet the instant I listened again, there was the doleful cry mo moaning moaning on. Be gone, I shouted. I'll never let you in, not if you beg for twenty years. It is twenty years, mourned the voice. Twenty years. I've been away for twenty years. Thereat began a feeble scratching outside, and the pile of books moved as if thrust forward. I tried to jump up, but could not stir a limb, so yelled out in a frenzy of fright. To my confusion, I discovered the yell was not ideal. Hasty footsteps approached my chamber door. Somebody pushed it open with a vigorous hand, and a light glimmered through the squares at the top of the bed. I sat shuddering yet, and wiping the perspiration from my forehead. The intruder appeared to hesitate and mutter to himself. At last, he said in a half whisper, plainly not expecting an answer, Is anyone here? I considered it best to confess my presence, for I knew Heathcliff's accents, and feared he might search further if I kept quiet. With, with this intention, I turned and opened the panels. I shall not soon forget the effect my action produced. Heathcliff stood near the entrance in his shirt and trousers, with a candle dripping over his fingers, and his face as white as the wall behind him. The first creak of the oak startled him like an electric shock. The light leaped from his hand to a distance of some feet, and his agitation was so extreme that he could hardly pick it up. It's only your guest, sir, I called out, desirous to spare him the humiliation of exposing his cowardice further. I had the misfortune to scream in my sleep owing to a frightful nightmare. I'm sorry I disturbed you. Oh, God confound you, Mr. Lockwood. I wish you were at the commenced, my host, setting the candle on a chair because he found it impossible to hold it steady. And who showed you up into this room, he continued, crushing his nails into his palms and grinding his teeth to subdue the maxillary convulsions. Who was it? I've a good mind to turn them out of the house this moment. It was your servant, Zilla, I replied, flinging myself onto the floor and rapidly resuming my garments. I should not care if you did, Mr. Heathcliff. She richly deserves it. I suppose that she wanted to get another proof that the place was haunted at my expense. Well, it is. Swarming with ghosts and goblins, you have reason in shutting it up, I assure you. No one will thank you for a doze in such a den. Coffee time. What do you mean? Asked Heathcliff. And what are you go? What are you doing? Lie down and finish out the night since you are here. But for heaven's sakes, don't repeat that horrid noise. Nothing could excuse it unless you were having your throat cut. If the little fiend had got in at the window, she probably would have strangled me, I return. I'm not going to endure the persecutions of your hospitable an ancestors again. Was not the Reverend Jabez Branderham akin to you on the mother's side? And that minx, Catherine Linton, or Earnshaw, or however she was called? She must have been a changeling, wicked little soul. She told me she'd been walking the earth these twenty years, a just punishment for her mortal transgressions. I've no doubt. Uh-oh. Scarcely were these words uttered when I recollect the, the association of Heathcliff's with Catherine's name in the book, which had completely slipped from my memory till thus awakened. I blushed at my inconsideration, but without showing further conscious uh, consciousness of the offense. I hasten to add, the truth is, sir, I passed the first part of the night in, here I stopped afresh, I was about to say perusing these old volumes, then it would have, re then it would have revealed my knowledge of their written as well as their printed contents. 
So correcting myself, I went on and spelling over the name scratched on that window ledge. A monotonous occupation calculated to set me asleep like counting or... What can you mean by talking in this way to me, thundered Heathcliff with savage vehemence. How how dare you under my roof? God, it's mad to speak so. And he struck his forehead with rage. I did not know whether to resent this language or pursue my explanation, but he seemed so powerfully afflict, affected that I took pity and proceeded with my dreams, affirming I had never heard the appellation of Catherine Linton before but reading it often over often over produced an impression which personified itself when I had no longer my imagination under control. Heathcliff gradually fell back into the shelter of the bed as I spoke, finally sitting down uh, almost concealed behind it. I guessed, however, by his irregular and intercepted breathing that he struggled to vanish, vanquish, an excess of violent emotion. Not liking to show him that I had heard the conflict, I continued my toilet rather noisily, looked at my watch, and soliloquized on the length of the night. Not three o'clock yet. I could have taken oath it had been six. Time stagnates here. We must surely have retired to rest at, at eight. Always at nine in winter and rise at four, said my host, surprising, suppressing a groan, and as I fancied by the motion of his arm, of his arm's shadow, dashing a tear from his eyes. Mr. Lockwood, he added, you may go into my room, you'll only be in the way coming downstairs so early, and your childish outcry has sent sleep to the devil for me. And for me, too, I replied, I'll walk in the yard till daylight, and then I'll be off, and you need not dread a repetition of my intrusion. I'm now quite cured of seeking pleasure in society. Be it country or town, a sensible man ought to find sufficient company in himself. Delightful company, muttered Heathcliff. Take the candle and go where you please. I shall join you directly. Keep out of the yard, though. The dogs are unchained. In the house, Juno mounts sentinel there. And nay, you can only ramble about the steps and passages. But away with you. I'll come in two minutes. I obeyed so far as to quit the chamber when ignorant. Where the narrow lobbies led, I stood still and was, and was witness involuntarily to a to a piece of superstition on the part of my landlord, which belied oddly his apparent sense. He got on the bed and wrenched open the lattice, bursting as he pulled at it into uncontrollable passion of tears. Come in, come in, he sobbed. Kathy, do come in. Oh, do once more. Oh, my heart's darling, hear me this time. Catherine, at last, the specter showed a specter's ordinary caprice. It gave no sign of being, but the snow and wind whirled wildly through, even reaching my station and blowing out the light. There was such anguish in the gush of grief that accompanied this raving that my compassion made me overlook its folly, and I drew off half angry to have listened at all and vexed at having related my ridiculous nightmare since it produced that agony, though why was beyond my comprehension. I descended cautiously to the lower regions and landed in the back kitchen, where a gleam of fire raked compactly together enabled me to rekindle my, my candle. Nothing was stirring except a brindled gray cat which crept from the ashes and saluted me, with a querulous mew, two benches shaped in sections of a circle nearly enclosed the hearth. On one of these I stretched myself, and Grimelkin mounted the other. We were both of us nodding ere any one invaded our retreat, and then it was Joseph shuffling down a wooden ladder that vanished in the roof through a trap, the ascent to his garret, I suppose. He cast a sinister look at the little 
flame which I had enticed to play between the ribs, swept the cat from its elevation and bestowing himself in the vacancy, commenced the operation of stuffing a three-inch pipe with tobacco. My presence in his sanctum was evidently esteemed a piece of impudence too shameful for remark. He silently applied the tube to his lips, folded his arms, and puffed away. I let him enjoy the luxury unannoyed, and after sucking out his last breath and, ha and heaving a profound sigh, he got up and departed as solemnly as he came. A more elastic footstep entered next, and now I opened my mouth for a good morning, but closed it again, the salutation unachieved for Hareton Earnshaw was performing his orison soto voci in his series of curse, curses directed against every object he touched. While he rummaged a corner for a spade or shovel to dig through the drifts, he glanced over the back of the bench, dilating his nostrils, and thought a little of exchanging civilities with me as with the as with my companion the cat. I guessed by his preparations that egress was allowed, and leaving my hard couch made a movement to follow him. He noticed this and thrust at an inner door with an end of the spade, intimating by an inarticulate inarticulate sound that there was the place where I must go if I changed my locality. It opened into the house where the females were already astir, Zilla urging flakes of flame up the chimney with colossal bellows, and Mrs. Heathcliff kneeling on the hearth reading a book by the aid of the blaze. She held the hand inter interposed between her furnace heat and her eyes, and seemed absorbed in her occupation, desisting from it only to chide the servant for covering her with sparks, or to push away a dog now and then that snoozled its nose over, over forwardly into her face. I was surprised to see Heathcliff there also. He stood by the fire, his back towards me, just finishing a stormy scene with poor Zilla who ever and anon interrupted her labor to pluck up the corner of her apron and heave an indignant groan. <coughs> and you, you worthless, he broke out as I entered, turning to his daughter-in-law and employing an epithet as harmless as a duck or sheep, but generally rep re resented by a dash. There you are at your idle tricks again. The rest of them do earn their bread. You live on my charity. Put your trash away and find something to do with it. You shall pray me for a plague of having you eternally in my sight. Do you hear, damnable jade? I'll put my trash away because you can make me if I refuse, answered the young lady, closing her book and throwing it on a chair. But I'll not do anything, though you should swear your tongue out, except what I please. Heathcliff lifted his head, and the speaker sprang to a safer distance. Obviously acquainted with his weight, having no desire to be entertained by cat and dog combat, I stepped forward briskly as if eager to partake the warmth of the hearth, and innocent of any knowledge of the interrupted dispute, each had enough decorum to, to suspend further hostilities. Heathcliff pace, placed his fist out of temptation in his pockets. Mrs. Heathcliff curled her lip and walked to a seat far off where she was kept her word, where she kept her word by playing the part of a statue during the remainder of my stay. That was not long. I declined joining their breakfast, and at the first gleam of dawn, took an opportunity of escaping into the free air, now clear and still, and cold as impalpable ice. Good grief, these chapters are long. Phew! <laughs> and I was going to try to get to the next chapter. 
My landlord had loaded me to stop ere I reached the bottom of the garden and offered to accompany me across the moor. It was well he did, for the whole hill back was one billowy white ocean. The swells and falls are indicating corresponding rises and depressions in the ground. Many pits, at least, were filled to a level, and entire ranges of mounds, the refuse of the the refuse of the quarries blotted from the chart which my yesterday's walk left pictured in my mind i had marked on one side of the road at intervals of six or seven yards a line of upright stones continued through the whole length of the barren these were erected and daubed with time with lime on purpose to serve as guides in the dark and also, when a fowl like the present confounded the deep swamps on either hand with the firmer path, but excepting a dirty dot pointing up here and there, all traces of their existence had vanished, and my companion found it necessary to warn me frequently to steer to the right or the left when I imagined I was following correctly the windings of the road. We exchanged little conversation, and he halted at the entrance of Thrushcross Park, saying I could make no error there. Our ado were limited to a hasty bow, and then I pushed forward, tr trusting to my own resources, for the porter's lodge is untenanted as yet. The distance from the gate to the grange is two miles. I believe I, if I have, I believe I managed to make it four what with losing myself among the trees and sinking up to sinking up to the neck in snow, a predicament which only those who, ex who have experienced it can appreciate some snow. At any rate, whatever were my wanderings, the clock chimed twelve as I entered the house, and that gave exactly an hour for every mile of the usual way home. From Wuthering Heights, my human fixture and her and her satellites rushed to welcome me, exclaiming tumultuously that they had completely given me up. Everybody conjectured that I perished last night, and they were wondering how they must set about the search for my remains. I bid them be quiet now that they saw me returned and benumbed to my very heart. I dragged upstairs vehem vehemence. Uh, hang on. Where did I stop? I dragged upstairs whence, after putting on dry clothes, I don't know why I said vehemence. I dragged upstairs whence after putting on dry clothes and pacing to and fro thirty or forty minutes to restore the animal heat. I adjourned to my study, feeble as a kitten, almost too much so, to enjoy the cheerful fire and smoking coffee which the servant had prepared for my refreshment. Whew! And that was just chapter three. Oh, mercy me. I don't know if I'm going to like this book or not. I may abandon it. I hate to do that, but oh, mercy. I don't know that I'm getting anything out of it. And if I'm not, I don't know how you can. Comment and tell me what you think. I think it's whew, too much. Too bad. Thank God for Anne of Green Gables is all I got to say. That's more my speed, I think. Okay, folks. Love you lots. And I will be back on later to do Anne of Green Gables. Love you lots. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Live at 5 today. Set your alarm. 5 Eastern. Whatever time that is for you, where you are. Here's the sign. See you later, alligators. After a while, crocodile. Bye-bye.